Yeah, thank you for coming out today. Yeah, so before I begin my TED Talk, I'd just like to start to play a game with y'all, if you're okay with that. So it's really easy to do. I'm just going to show you guys a couple slides right here. And what I want you to do is, in your head, create kind of an idea or like one thought that comes to mind. So I'm going to show you about seven or eight pictures. You'll be able to get this. So sand, desert, tomb, gold, money, mummy, pyramid. OK, those, those are about the seven. So I think if you can figure out by now, I'm talking about ancient Egypt. From thousands of years ago, this society has been a cornerstone of what we believe in today. Some ideas like mathematics and architecture and hieroglyphics and what's going on, these are things that are in the past and have built the foundation of what we're doing today. But what I kind of think about and what's recently been going on is that recently we're discovering more stuff from the society that's actually been kind of impacting us right now directly. So in 2017, as shown by the picture right here, there was a t in the tomb of a mummy, they found actually a prosthetic toe. So this toe isn't like the prosthetics that we have today that are shaped out of metal and plastic and actually have a little more functionality and movement. But these, uh, this toe right here was made out of leather and rock, as you see right there. And it was made so that a person could walk or just function. So, and you also got to realize too, is that during ancient Egypt, they, their shoes that they were wearing weren't like dress shoes that I'm wearing today. They were actually sandals, mostly. And to walk around with little, like, like little to no like, foot right here or a toe, that kind of meant something. So that was there for a purpose. And how this was invented is because of biomedical engineering. And even though it wasn't around during the time, the process of building this and creating this kind of technology from 3,000 years ago and even till today is still relevant to our lives. Oh, let me go back right there. So for biomedical engineering itself, in essence, is solving problems. But engineering itself is solving problems do like engineering, mathematics, physics. But for biomedical engineering, it's doing that for the healthcare space. There are many different fields and kind of jobs in this industry. For biomedical engineering, there's kind of medical device reps that create technologies that are kind of used as staple technologies. So these are the ones that you kind of see in hospitals. So they're like the beds that you see, the heart monitors, things that have already been invented and been improved upon time and time again, but are still functioning. Then there are technologies that are kind of being created like that are for imaging. So imaging technologies include like x-rays, 3D like imaging, and just looking inside the human body through imaging purposes. Um, and those are kind of also staple things too. But it's most interesting in my opinion is the technologies that are being created for like innovation in the future. These technologies can include like stem cell research and editing the human genome, which are right now in its very early stages. But as the audience, it's really cool to hear about these technologies, but in essence, it doesn't impact us that much. But I would have to disagree, because some time ago, with these technologies that are the basic ones, like the heart monitors, or what I'm trying to say, is that those technologies at one point in time were the foundation, like the out of space technologies that we never saw. But in some time, as time went on, and they became more invented and defined upon, they became staple technologies. And these technologies I'm going to mention today are those ones out there, but in the next five to 10 years could be the staple technologies that we're most interacting with our daily lives. So one of the technologies I like to mention is what I saw what Linda mentioned before and when I went to California was a technology that defies the laws of matter itself. So you know how water is in a pot and when you heat it up, it boils? Well, this technology reverses all of that. So instead, when you heat it up, instead of boiling, it hardens like a rock. But when you cool it down inversely, it actually turns to a liquid. And when you put it inside the human body at around 98.7 degrees, or kind of normal body temperature, it hardens up. And right now, there's been some ways that can be innovative on to stay in the body and like help treat diseases. Another way that I think is super cool, or another technology, is you know, for blindness, that we have procedures such as LASIK going on and, and other ways that like, you can help like, define like, blindness and help it, but really there's no actual cure. This technology is the size of 60 atoms, and it goes into your, into your eye and your cornea, and it's able to act as a cornea. So I want to give you a little reference to how that, big, uh, how that is. So if you take up your hand right now and you look at your nail, you can kind of see it. So... But when you look at it, or 
Uh, let's give you a reference. Is that if you look at it from 60 atoms, like let's say you try to look at your nail at 60 atoms, can you do that? No, exactly. To do that, it's a technology is super, super small that can go in, and soon in the next five to 10 years, it's gonna be super relevant to, it's gonna be really relevant in our lives. Another way that this is super interesting is that even though in the audience right now, these staple technologies I've described before, like the heart monitors, is that we interact with those more than you would think, even like the basic ones. I just wanna ask the audience a one quick question here. How many of you are wearing medical devices right now? Okay, so I see like maybe a couple yeses. Some people may be wearing glasses or like maybe like a, a filler or, no, or like um, prosthetic or something. But let me ask this again. Is anybody wearing contacts here? Yeah. Does anybody have a filler in their teeth or like a crown in their teeth? Okay. So those are all, in essence, biomedical engineering devices or biotechnology. We are interacting with those technologies every single day. This isn't an industry that's outside of our influence. It's directly in our lives. And what I want to say, too, is that to get into this industry, it is just as easy as what I said before. We are intertwined with this. We are a part of this. And I'm going to give an example here to kind of show you how people like us, all in the audience, even though we may not have degrees of some sort, we can all get into this field or at least be innovators. So I'd like to mention first is that to give you guys a little story, there was a guy from Keller, Texas. This is a very local story too. There was a guy from Keller, Texas that was on a flight from New York to here. And what well, he'd been having some like flu-like symptoms before, but so he, so he was having, feeling a little down. But when this man came over here, he was feeling way more dizzy and way, like, way worse. Like, he was barely able to walk out of the airplane. So coming over to the hospital really quickly, he was able to, like, kind of get, like, his, he, the doctors checked him out. And what they saw was actually that he had clots going from his leg into his lungs. And if anything, anybody of y'all know anything about clots, if there are clots going to your heart or to your lungs, that's a heart attack or a stroke. So this is very, very bad. And so the next morning he was put on the operating table and he had surgery done. But what's special about this surgery is that as you usually would think to remove clots, it would take like, 30, like, an, like a long time because this is a very delicate procedure that's life-threatening. This would take like six hours or something. This would take like an entire doctor's day. But instead of that, it took just 30 minutes. The man wasn't even under anesthesia and he was able to immediately feel better. And this technology that was created was to solve a problem. So as I mentioned before, engineering is solving problems. The technologies that I've mentioned before too are to help and create, but in the essence are to solve problems. And these problems were, like, were solved by three individuals just like you and me. And they saw an issue in the clot care industry. So to give a little more preface, clots were treated kind of three ways before this technology came out. And they still are today. So one way is through thrombolytics, which is a pill taken in the mouth. And what it does, it kind of acts like an ibuprofen. So it goes into your body like a Motrin in essence, finds pain, or in this case a clot, and treats it. But this has a lot of inverse effects that are not good. So sometimes if you have too much of the clot, it can cause brain bleeds. So instead of actually treating a patient, helping it like by, dos by dissolving a clot, in essence, it could hurt or even kill a patient. Also, there's been new ways of like inserting a catheter in the body to remove or suction out a clot, but sometimes there are clots still stuck in the body that cannot get it out. I didn't mention this, but there are kind of like around two different types of clots. There are clots in the bloodstream and clots in the walls of your body. And the clots in the bloodstream are really easy to get out because they're just like floating little rocks in like water. Like you see sand in the water, they're just kind of going back and forth and they can kind of move around. These are dangerous too because they, as I said before, the Keller man, it went from his legs all the way to his heart. That's how these kind of clots work. But also, there are different types of clots. Sometimes they get stuck to the walls of the arteries. These ones are, in fact, a lot harder to get out. And with most medication going on right now, it's almost impossible because these things are just crystal rock solid. So what these guys, these guys figured out is that, one, we need to have a better way to get into the body, to get the clot itself. And then two, once we're there, we need to figure out how we can get into the body and remove the ones on the walls. And so what they did is they invented this three-step process with this technology that I'm about to show you here, and it's guide wire, suck, and scrape. It's really simple. It involves a lot of engineering, 
but it's really easy to use. It's very simple. And even though it takes a lot of like education to get this done, anybody could be in this field to achieve this or even create kind of a technology similar to like this. Let me get into it a little more. So the first step is the guy wire. So you'd say, let's, let, let's pretend you're in a corn maze. I know there's one in Colleyville that's really big, so you guys have may have been there before. So there's a corn maze you go around, and any corn maze, basically the goal is to get to the other side, right? But when you're going through the corn maze, sometimes you take a wrong turn or you go to a wrong direction. What happens is, is then you can just go backwards and try to figure out from there. And that's exactly what the guide wire does. It's not sharp like barbed wire. It's very fragile, fragile and it goes into the body. It's usually for this technology being inserted around the leg or the neck. It goes in, the doctor is able to maneuver it around, and if it messes up, it goes into the wrong artery or vein, the doctor can just take it out, move it around again until it finds a clot. That's the first step. Very easy. It's not a lot of engineering. It's just getting to the clot. Second step, that is called the suctioning. So what I said before is that catheters have been around for some time, but this catheter is a little more special. So that's a little bit of the part of it I'll get to in just a second, but the catheter comes into the body and it sucks the clot out immediately. But to do this, it needs this thing right here. And this is like a stop clock. So basically what happens is, is that you connect the clot, you, you get the guy wire, you get the catheter up here, and that creates a little suction between each side. So when you have a little pressure in the body, it's easier when you release that pressure to make things move. And that's exactly what this does. So you know how like when you drink a straw, you like slurp it up like whew. That's kind of what it does too. So with, you turn the knob right here, you get to go, and then for, as a doctor, you just pull it back and it goes right in. Or at least that's the claw on the outside. That's the second step. The third step is probably the hardest part that they were trying to work on the most, is that there's clots in the walls. So I just want to say too, to give you a little reference, is that this clot right here scoops up in milliseconds. You know how I say like when you drink something, it takes like, like a short amount of time to get to your like body? But when this thing, it goes immediately. It's very, very fast. But when you have clots on the walls of your body that are just hard as a rock, even this suctioning that's super quick isn't going to get to them. So what happens is, is that they decide a third thing, and this is the metal rings, or in essence, I like to call scrape. It goes into the body, the scraping function goes into the body, it opens these metal rings right here, and what it does is it just pulls it out. It acts as like it uses the wall itself to pull it out. And that sounds really easy in essence, but this is a difficult problem to logically solve, is that Arteries and veins in the heart and the body are very, very, very malleable and fragile. Like, you could go and like, cut somebody open and just bend an artery and it'd snap. So, they're working with metal right here and they had to design a something, or at least like the metal rings right here, to go inside of a vein, grab the clot, scoop it out, but not damage the, uh, the artery itself. And so, that's the third thing of engineering that goes on behind this. And what I was fortunate enough to do this summer was actually to go and see this technology in action. I was able to actually kind of perform this surgery, not on a live patient, okay? I didn't get to perform on a live patient. I'm not a doctor. That's, that wouldn't be good. I, 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 I don't think I'd be here. I'd probably be in jail for doing that. But <laughs> what, what I did was I got to kind of perform like a simulated surgery. Instead of the clot, I got to use Play-Doh. So that's kind of my version of conducting surgery. So, I got to use Play-Doh and got to suck it out. And what I experienced is that even though this took a lot of engineering and a lot of math behind this to figure it out and how to suction it correctly, this is very easy to do. And it's also very easy to get into because all of you here at least can see problems in our world and are able to innovate and solve upon them. Like what I mean by that is like you look around and you're like, oh, I hate this person or like I don't like this or I don't like what's going on right now. That's innovation itself. That's engineering. And even though I'm talking about biomedical engineering in this case, we are all innovators. We are all creators. So technically, any one of us can be an engineer. These businesses I'm talking about, the gel company was founded by two people. The microchip I talked about was only founded by two people also. And these are just two people, like you and me, with a similar idea, and just that they saw a problem and they wanted to find a solution. So, if I'm able to, 
Yeah, um, is that these people are just like you and me. And that, and especially in South Lake, there are innovations going on right now. Like, I mean, this man in Keller was f solved for a problem in like 30 minutes from one of these technologies. And I mean, even as you realize from like the medical device stuff, you guys are all affected by this. And this kind of drives me too, is that this is kind of why I wanted to go to college and pursue engineering in some way, shape, or form, is that I want to be the next person to be able to solve this kind of problems. And anybody can do this too. Thank you.